Hello, this is Simon Brew. I'm the editor of Film Stories magazine and a very warm welcome to the Film Stories podcast. Come with me. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. In movies, movies that have stories. That the story just sucks them in. This is just the beginning. Film Stories. We would be honored if you would join us. Hello and a very warm welcome to Film Stories with Simon Brew. I am Simon Brew, as always, it's absolutely everything you need to know about me. In the podcast, though, well, it's given away by the title. I'm here to talk of the stories of films, and I tend to talk about development stories, production stories, marketing stories, release stories, all the ingredients, really, that go towards making the films that we know and sometimes love. Just that, the films that we know and sometimes love. The films I tend to cover on this podcast, they lean more towards the mainstream than anything else. They're films I'm interested in or invested in to some degree. I try not to do snark. I try not to punch down. This podcast is a celebration of cinema and a real appreciation, really, that somehow, for all the difficulties, movies get made. And for this particular episode, heck, is there a story? Let me take you back into the world of Walt Disney Animation. Let me take you back to the 1980s. I'm going to set this story up with a clip from the trailer for the film. And then we'll come to it the other side of this. Legend has it, there was once a king so cruel and so evil that the gods feared him. Since no prison could hold him, he was trapped forever in the form of a great black cauldron. The old king, that black-hearted devil. Walt Disney Pictures presents The Black Cauldron. Escape into a world of darkness. Are you coming? Me? Go in there? Oh, no, no, no. It's a terrible place. A world of excitement. A world of dreams. Aaron, the greatest warrior, the true hero. And through the magic of 70 millimeter photography and six track Dolby sound, you will be transported to a fantasy event for the entire family. Now, I just ran that clip long enough to get the key words in there that Disney sold this film in the trailer as a family event for all the family. A family event. If you've seen The Black Cauldron, my life, within about five minutes, it's very clear the last thing it is, is a family event. The film's eventual credited directors, Ted Berman and Richard Rich, the film is The Black Cauldron, dating back to 1985. Well, quite a lot of credits on it. I mean, the story in the end was credited to Ted Berman, Vance Jerry, Joe Hale, David Jonas, Ray, uh, Roy Morita, Richard Rich, Art Stevens, Al Wilson, Peter Young. The source is Lloyd Alexander's books, which I'll come to shortly. A voice cast who I don't really touch on in the bit we're going to talk about, but it's Grant Bardsley, Susan Sheridan, Freddie Jones, Nigel Hawthorne in there. Arthur Malay, James By- uh, John Byner, Phil Fondacaro and John Hurt. God bless John Hurt. So in the aftermath of the death of Walt Disney towards the end of the 1960s, Walt Disney animation needed really to find itself a fresh footing. That it, had, it I mean, it had built up off a bunch of animators who'd stayed with the company for a very long time. And the stories really were, were I mean, you sort of knew roughly what you were going to get. It was in 1971 that Disney turned its attention to Lloyd Alexander's stories, The Chronicles of Prydain. Now, this is five books that had Welsh mythology at their their foundations, really. And so Disney took an option on them with the plan being to take the first of those two, uh, the, the first two of those books, that would be The Book of Three and The Black Cauldron, and use that as the basis for an animated feature film. So the deal was complete in 1973 and development work got underway at that point. It had uh, some of the legendary gang of Walt Disney's nine old men working on the film. The nine old men were anointed in the 1950s, really, by Disney himself as as basically the, the rock, the cornerstone of Disney's animation work. They were the key animators that Disney himself had identified. And two of that legendary gang were involved in choosing this particular project. They would be 
Ollie Johnson and Frank Thomas. The subject themselves are a really interesting documentary called Frank and Ollie, which I think is still just about on Disney+. Plus. But still, there was a denseness, a richness to Lloyd Alexander's stories that made them incredibly hard to adapt. They were effectively trying to boil to, well, there's no effectively, they were trying to boil two of five books down to what, a 90 minute feature film, one that all the family could enjoy. It had a very large cast list. I mean, straight away, that was impractical for any kind of movie, really. It had to be manageable. You had to be able to get a handle on it all. And so the development work got underway and there was lots of work on which direction to take the story. There was lots of early work done as well on the, just the sheer look of the film. But several years went by and then it was in August 1978 that the New York Times ran an article about the film that would become The Black Cauldron. Now at that point it was pegged as a film that was going to cost 15 million dollars. 15 million dollars in 1978 was a very very high movie budget. This was not Disney skimping on it. This was in fact originally earmarked as the studio's big release for 1980. However, that summer 1978 New York Times report, well, really, it put across the fact that this film was in trouble, that it was already four years behind schedule. Now, if you consider at the moment that a high-end Disney animated film tends to take four years start to finish, the fact that The Black Cauldron was four years late, it wasn't even taking four years to complete, it was four years late, was quite something. Now, the problem was an animator shortage. There were several problems, but that was at the heart of it. And the studio boss at the time was a man called Ron Miller. He had been handpicked by Walt Disney to be his successor. And Miller was overseeing really a generational shift that was taking place at Disney, that it had this crop of animators who had, who had come up with the company and enjoyed the success and helped build the success of the company and its animated films. And on the flip side of that, there were new recruits coming in and really those new recruits needed a level of expertise that they didn't have at the start of the Black Cauldron project. And so there was a point where Disney decided to switch the emphasis of its efforts to another film it had going, which was The Fox and the Hound, which was earmarked for 1980. But actually that would end up late too, which I'm coming to shortly. So it was at the end of the 1970s where things really went wrong here that Disney had been enjoying the fruits of re-releasing its animated films. They were helping put some money in the coffers and there were projects on the go that would help bring really build up the experience level of the incoming animators. That Heading up the animation team at that point was a man called Don Bluth. He was said to be working on a 25 minute short film to help these new animators cut their teeth on something substantive. Short films at this point were making Disney no money, but in terms of giving animators a chance to just get their hands dirty, were very, very useful vehicles. And then, of course, there was The Fox and the Hound, which was a much more straightforward and very traditional style of Disney film, although that in itself caused lots of upset. That's a whole story for another time. But it was animals in a wood, and you know th this was kind of the stuff that Disney was a lot more familiar with. But Don Bluth would really be the catalyst for some significant change that went on at Disney because by 1979, he, just, he was just desperately unhappy. He had been identified as the cream of the next generation of animation talent at the studio. And he got to the point where in his late 30s, he was heading up its animation unit. But in 1979, frustrated at how slowly the Black Cauldron Project was moving as well as lots of other issues at the studio, he left. Now, Don Hahn is a producer of Disney films such as Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, but also an excellent documentarian. He's been a guest on this podcast before talking about his film Howard, about the life and times of the late Howard Ashman. But for the purposes of this particular story, it's his documentary feature, Waking Sleeping Beauty, that I really just cannot recommend enough. This is Don Hahn telling the story from an insider's perspective of how Walt Disney feature animation and basically got to the edge of the cliff, nearly just out of business altogether and pulled itself back. And the Black Cauldron was what was pushing it towards that cliff edge. Han charts this superbly in his film. And he also talks about the impact that Don Bluth's department 
de departure really from Disney had because it wasn't just Bluth that went he took 14 what well, I've seen different sources I've seen 13 people or 14 people what they tend to agree on though is it was basically half of the animation payroll went with him as per a Los Angeles Times report on September the 13th 1979 that was the day that Don Bluth just just dropped his bombshell and he and his team of animators went off to set up another company starting their work in Don Bluth's garage. At the point this happened, I mean, it, it opened up some gaps for other animating talent to come through. This is how people like John Lasseter and Tim Burton got their break in Disney. But still, as Don Bluth would later on explain to the Los Angeles Times, we were just a group who loved animation and felt it had disintegrated into something quite inane. He said Walt wasn't there and the pictures were just repeats of things he'd done. I mean, films like Fox and the Hand were not inspiring people. He said we wanted things to work there, but it's hard to reshape an old company. It's like trying to bend an old oak. So Bluth quickly away from Disney was pushing an animated feature called The Secret and Nim, which came together a lot quicker than The Black Cauldron did. But also this was really the impetus Disney needed to get its own foot on the accelerator. However, it had to fill in the gaps it had internally. It had to replenish its ranks of animators and they had to be brought into the Disney fold and the way of doing things. And so the immediate knock on of that was the Fox and the Hound was delayed a year. And again, the Fox and the Hound, far more straightforward project, really. But that went from 1980 to 1981. 1980 it was roughly the point where the Black Cauldron formally got its green light as well, where Disney just got off the fence and just said, yep, yeah, Ron Miller just, we're going to do this. We're going to press forward with it. It had had six odd years of development to that point. And as per the earlier New York Times report, it was already four years behind schedule. It was about to get even more behind schedule and the price was starting to go up as well. Just because it had the green light, it didn't mean the problems were going away. In fact, it meant there were more just coming down the track at speed. But at the heart of the decision to make the Black Cauldron in the first place was Disney really taking a leap. And I think this is often forgive, uh, forgotten, really, that it was taking a gamble, that it could, as Don Bluth had noted, make repeats of the same pictures and then re-release its old movies. That wouldn't be a problem, that it could keep making money that way. But what Disney features were not attracting were teenagers. Teenagers are a very lucrative part of the market that you could put out an animation like The Fox and the Hound and you get under 10s and their parents in. But if you really wanted to make a bigger hit, you've got to broaden the audience for the films. In fact, Walt Disney, uh, as a broader studio, would struggle with this right throughout the 80s and 90s, attracting a teenage audience. And it wouldn't really crack it until the early 2000s when it bought up Marvel, when it bought up uh, Lucasfilm as well and then all of a sudden it had the feature films that teenagers were desperate to see but the late 1970s the early 1980s Disney was a, a film a, a company really making kids films kids and family films and that was what it was known as the project the Black Cauldron project was not short of ambition it wasn't just that they picked material that they felt could transcend their usual audience Disney had also decided to really go for it that it was trying to set a high watermark for its animation not least because it had a new competitor snapping at its heels and so it was going to be filmed in 70 millimeter this is a big dramatic gesture the first time a Disney animated film had, had been in 70 millimeter since Sleeping Beauty and as you heard in the clip right at the start there to be released with six track sound which a commonplace now but that was a, a ramp up at that point and of course it's animation you have to create all of those sounds from scratch you can't take a microphone out and and just accompany it with live action footage everything had to be made it was setting itself one hell of a job if we pinpoint that production started in 1980, which is generally the consensus on the Black Cauldron, although it's one of those where lots of people have different stories, 
the, the story I'm zeroing in on is by an animator called Michael Parazza. Now, in the early in the early 2010s, Parazza was putting together a terrific blog which has been archived online. And he wrote about his experience as one of the animators working on The Black Cauldron and in particular, the cultural problems behind the scenes of the movie. Because in an article that he entitled Cauldron of Chaos, and what Parazza had noted was that the schism that existed in the animation building, he said he wrote in this corner, there were the veterans, including what was left of Walt's nine old men. He said they were almost all gone by then, although thankfully some would still come by and check in with us from time to time. But he said in another corner, there was a generation of great artists that hadn't really had their opportunity to strut their stuff with the old guard in place and were hoping to get their chance. Now, the Black Cauldron would give some of them a chance. The directors were ultimately Art Stevens, Ted Berman and Rick Rich were chosen to take that job on. Although by the end of the production, Art Stevens would not be one of the credited product, uh, directors. But also, interestingly, one of the original directors of the Black Cauldron was set to be a man called John Musker. Now, Musker was a very upcoming animator through the Disney ranks and he had been mentored uh, to a degree by the nine old men as well and this was to be his directorial debut but his tone for where he wanted to take the black cauldron was determined to be too light and so disney appointed a producer by the name of joe hale and he was the person who was going to have to get this film ultimately from a to b he came on board in 1980 and under his watch things got even darker and that meant there was no place for John Musker or the person who would go on to be his directorial partner across his career, Ron Clements. Now, they went off to do a picture called The Great Mouse Detective, as we know it here in the UK. Uh, Basil, The Great Mouse Detective, a film I'm really, really, really fond of. But it's interesting that the people who were who were shuttled away off the project were the ones who would be absolutely fundamental in Disney's ultimate resurgence in animation. They would direct, Musker and Clements would direct The Little Mermaid. They would direct Aladdin. In more recent times, they directed Moana and gave the studio some of its biggest hits, but they weren't determined to be right for The Black Cauldron. Production then was <laughs> ongoing without them, really. And uh, let's go back to Pratt's article. He just talked about how the layout department was given gorgeous new 70 millimeter widescreen charts from our scene planning department to compose their scenes. But Pratt's said after using them for a few weeks, I found myself comparing them to an old set Don Griffith of Disney had given to me from working on Sleeping Beauty. And perhaps I noticed a marked difference in the width versus height ratio. As he wrote, unfortunately, by the time I discovered the discrepancy and went to Dave Thompson in the scene planning to show him, quite a few scenes had already been handed out to the animators and thus had to be adjusted as we were given the new, improved and corrected field charts. It wasn't quite a case that the work had to be completely redone, but time had to be taken to go and make the corrections. An avoidable error, really. Outside of specifically the production of The Black Cauldron, there were broader issues, really, with regards to cartoonists working in and around Hollywood. And that led to um, a, well, a, real, a further challenge for the production, because for 10 weeks in 1982, as the film was supposed to be moving forward, animators across Hollywood went on strike. This, this basically brought The Black Cauldron to an absolute standstill. And so... For nearly three months, really, the project lay pretty much dormant. And then as it continued to go through development, I mean, it did finally move forward with the idea of get the film out by 1984, which was finally looking doable. There was another big upheaval behind the scenes because as much as The Black Cauldron was challenging just the sheer ambition of what Disney had done on screen before, the techniques that were being used to animate it were, were really ramping up. There was so much in the craft of the film and the way it was being put together that was, that was trying to evolve Disney. The biggest evolution in the studio in the midst of all of this was in the boardroom that Ron Miller, again, the man who'd been handpicked by Walt Disney to head up the studio, was ultimately defenestrated as Disney's chairman. 
the people brought in to take over, well, they came across from Paramount Pictures, where they'd been enjoying an enormous amount of success and Disney wanted that success. So installed as Disney's new chairman of the overall company was a man called Michael Eisner, who would stay with Disney for a couple of decades. Books have been written about Michael Eisner's time at the top of Disney, not least by Eisner himself. And he brought with him then his colleagues soon. Uh, they would Well, eventually they would part company with some animosity. But at this point, he brought with him a man called Jeffrey Katzenberg as studio chairman. Now, in the mid 1990s, Katzenberg and Eisner would have a very uh, obvious Obvious falling out and Katzenberg would go and co-found the DreamWorks Animation Studio but at this point they were working together. Katzenberg heading up the studio, Eisner heading up the overall company and the first signs were not good for the animation division when the pair came in that there were reportedly conversations about shutting down Walt Disney Animation altogether. And I mean, it was it was Don Han in the midst of all of this, who was one of the people trying to hold it together as a production manager on the Black Cauldron, even as things in the boardroom were changing. And he talked to Collider about this. He just described how I was the guy who walked around with a clipboard and asked what scenes they would have done that week. And he described this bizarre situation where there were three directors and the three directors didn't always talk and that instead they would go to Joe Hale who would have to mediate between them all but the three directors were splitting up sequences and as Hans said with each sequence having completely a different tone and tempo that nothing was really matching here the animation wasn't matching the atmosphere wasn't ma matching and Han not <laughs> with no understatement described it as another part of the problem. There was also that schism again between the old guard animators and the incoming young animators to the point where the old guard and the new the new guard, if you like, were on separate floors at the studio and they weren't even getting in the same room to talk. So in comes Eisner and Katzenberg. Now, ahead of this, Roy Disney, who was now by now heading up animation, was, well, he'd seen an early cut of the film and he was not happy. He was said to be incredibly disturbed by the violence in the Black Cauldron, by the graphic opening of the film as well. And so it hadn't gone down with him. By the time it had screened for Eisner and Katzenberg, heck, it hadn't gone down well with them either. Katzenberg was said to have absolutely hated the initial rough cut of the film that he saw which was running to about 92 minutes and he wanted big changes to it this was in 1984 this was months ahead of the release of the film and Katzenberg at this point was an absolute novice to animation and so I, a lot of this is charted in James Stewart's book, Disney War, which I've used a few times on this podcast. But Katzenberg, again, not understanding the process, just turned to Joe Hale and said, well, you've got to edit it. You've got to change it. You've got to you, you've got to take, you know, t stuff out of this. You've got to rework it. And Hale had to explain. It's just like, no, everything you see is handcrafted. You can't use a different take of a shot because that was the take that was drawn. That was it. That is all you can do. Katzenberg told Joe Hale, you've got to edit the film. You've got to take 10 minutes out of it. Hale stood his ground and said no. Katzenberg went into the edit suite himself to start the work. And so at this point, Joe Hale was not a happy person, as you would expect. He put in a call to Roy Disney. Roy Disney at that point was having lunch with Michael Eisner. And again, as James Stewart notes in his book, he's butchering the Black Cauldron. Hale fumed about Katzenberg. Now, now, it was admitted that The Black Cauldron was a dark film, but again, the whole idea, Disney knew that going in. That bit wasn't a surprise, although the new management, it was a surprise to them. But the idea was they're trying to be more contemporary. They're trying to be edgier. The animators, when they learned that Jeffrey Katzenberg was in the edit room hacking away at their work, they were in absolute uproar. And so in the end, Michael Eisner fairly quickly had to intervene and he had to get Jeffrey Katzenberg out of the editing room. As he said, what, what are you doing? He said to Katzenberg, everybody's upset. And in the end, Eisner did calm Katzenberg down. And he, I mean, it, he left the editing room, but he told the team in no uncertain terms, you've got to fix the movie. Now, this did not cultivate a friendship between Roy Disney and Jeffrey Katzenberg at that point. That was a, a difficult relationship as well. But 
the cutting of the Black Cauldron was was underway again, that Katzenberg was the boss of the animation division. If he ultimately wanted it cut down, it had to be cut down. And after a decade of work to get to this point, the final cut of the Black Cauldron was really been hacked together at the last minute and not to the film's benefit. I mean, if you've ever watched the final cut of the film, A, you've got nightmares and, and you need a good therapist. But B, I mean, the continuity of it, the sense of it isn't quite there. There is a sense that things are missing. Still, Disney delayed the film to try and accommodate some of the changes. It moved it from Christmas 1984 to summer of 1985. And in the end, the film was trimmed by about 10 to 12 minutes. One of the casualties of this was Elmer Bernstein's score for the film. It was quite, again, quite a leap for Disney to be releasing an animated film with no songs in it. And so Elmer, particularly in the 80s, I mean, particularly at this point in its history. And so Elmer Bernstein's score was going to have to carry some of the load. But most of that gone was gone. And of course, the studio around the Black Cauldron was not standing still. There were other films that were being developed. In fact, Joe Hale and many of the Black Cauldron uh, team were expected to move on to an animated feature called Mistress Masham's Repose, which was in development as well. And of course, the Great Mouse Detective project was also moving. But now it was all about the build up to the release of the Black Cauldron, July the 24th, 1985. And with a price tag, this didn't come out for many, many years. In fact, it was Don Han who revealed it. A price tag that had ballooned to $44 million in 1980s money. $44 million, an incredible amount of money to spend on any film. And, and Disney was, I, I mean, it was all in. So much so, in fact, that when the Motion Picture Association of America came back with a PG rating, I still think Disney got off light there, it went with it. This was the first Disney animated movie to carry a PG. I remember when Pixar, I think it was The Incredibles, was the first Pixar film to get a PG, and such a big deal was made of that. Here in the 1980s, it, I mean, pathfinding was underway. It just wouldn't go anywhere near as well. The Black Cauldron arrived, I mean, five years late, really, twice as expensive, and in the end nearly took Disney animation down. The reviews of the film actually were really, really strong. And on a technical level, the 75mm, the six-channel sound, that was singled out for praise. But also, the, the fact that it was such a swing was and, and so different from what people were expecting from Disney, in many critical circles, it earned it very, very strong to, to good write-ups. Even Lloyd Alexander would, I mean, he would say that the, the film doesn't really sit alongside the book particularly, but he enjoyed the film. It's not an adaptation of his stories that he considered really, but the film he was quite happy with. There were naysayers really that who weren't so keen on it. However, off it went into cinemas on that weekend, July the 26th to the 28th, and there was competition out there. I mean, the films that were out were Kiss of the Spider Woman, there was The Heavenly Kid was released, but National Lampoon's European Vacation was the number one movie that weekend. On its opening week, uh, it opened with $12.3 million in the US. Films that were also in cinemas, I mean, Back to the Future was in second place on its fourth week of release, 9.4 million it took on its fourth week. E.T., a re-release of E.T., many years after the original, that was in third place, $5 million. You made more money re-releasing E.T. than spending $44 million on The Black Cauldron. It opened in fourth with $4.1 million. Now, no matter, you might think, and, and rightly so, because family movies tend to build audiences over a period of time and the expectation was at the very least the Black Cauldron might do that. I mean there was other family fare around at that point. The Goonies was towards the bottom of the chart although Rambo First Blood Part 2 wasn't attracting quite as many families. The problem with the Black Cauldron was the word of mouth was not helping it and so the following week films such as Fright Night and Weird Science came out. Black Cauldron dropped to fifth as Back to the Future went up 
to first place. That was on week five of release and it was comfortably outgrossing Disney's movie. The Black Cauldron disastrously dropped out of the top ten altogether after three weeks. Other films that were knocking it down, Real Genius, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Summer Rental came out. By the end of the summer it was clear that this was not going to be salvaged. Week four it was down to 16th place. Almost unthinkable for a Disney animation. Uh, Teen Wolf then comes along the following week. That makes a fair amount of money. A re-release of Ghostbusters makes a fair amount of money. But by the time The Black Cauldron limped out of US cinemas, its box office was uh, way below what Disney needed to be. What, 20, 21 million dollars? It was, there was no way of rewriting this. It was a massive disappointment. And it was leaving a real hole in Disney's bottom line as well. Was animation really worth still investing in if this was, you know, if this was the kind of return that the studio could have, has it lost its magic touch? It's telling as well. The legacy of the film is a very bumpy one. I mean, how long did it take for us to get a proper DVD release of it? Ages. And even now, we don't have a Blu-ray of it. We don't have a 4K disc of it. You go round a Disney theme park, if you find any mention of the Black Cauldron in anything other than a slight Easter egg, you are doing incredibly well. When they run those floats down the Disney theme parks with all the characters, there is not a single character from the Black Cauldron on them, I can tell you that. There was also the end credits of Disney's 2023 100th anniversary animation feature, Wish. And across the end credits of that, there are visual nods to virtually every Disney animated film to that point. One of those, that, one of those that's missing, that would be The Black Cauldron. And it's not a film that Disney has deleted entirely. It's certainly done its fair share of those, but it's just hidden at the back. It's not something Disney wants to talk about. And if you sit and watch it, and even now, and sit, I, I mean, it's chilling and fast. It really, I, the 80s was not shy of very, very creepy family films. This was full on, I would suggest. But in the end, Disney decided to stick with animation and the Black Cauldron would hasten the reset at Disney Animation as well. Joe Hale would leave fairly soon after this, as would several who'd worked on the film. Mistress Masham's Repose, that would be quickly cancelled. But it was films such as The Great Mouse Detective and Oliver and Company that kind of reset the tone and started to rebuild an audience for the studio. But in the end, it was those two animators taken off the Black Cauldron who would be at the heart of what became, just five years later really, Disney's second golden age of animation. Ron Clements and John Musker, along with Howard Ashman, producer and composer, again the subject of that excellent Howard documentary. Well, they were the ones, they were crucial to fashioning what became The Little Mermaid. And in the aftermath of The Little Mermaid, that, I, I mean, it just revolutionised, revolutionised what Disney animation was standing for again. I mean, standing too, looking back at their success, Clements and Musker would recall how they were, quote, basically banished from the Black Cauldron. Going back to that uh, Michael Parazza thing as well, I mean, just to tie up Jeffrey Katzenberg's, uh, he did say that, that yeah, Parazza did write that Jeffrey wasn't really a, an animation person. However, he proved to be a very hardworking exec and showed how serious he was in rectifying his lack of knowledge by immediately going into a thorough self-education process involving every step of the creative and production processes used in Disney feature animation. He soon became a hands-on manager who garnered the respect of quite a few on the staff, including me, and along with Roy Disney's help and guidance would see Disney's animation eventually regain its prominence in the field. It would not take that long to do, ironically enough. Hale went Several others, got, uh, that, that new guard of animators, got their chance. And in Beauty and the Beast, actually, the, the 1991 film, you, what you see there is a fascinating marriage of that old guard versus new guard, but actually working more together. Meanwhile, as, though, as the tone of Disney films going forward was set, there has been a kind of fonder look back at The Black Cauldron, that, that, an appreciation that it was taking bold swings a lot earlier than anyone else was in the family movie space. And perhaps in terms of its rehabilitation in Disney history, at least, it was quite telling that in 2020, 
Disney went back to this world and acquired the rights to the entire Chronicles of Prodane series of books with a view to a live action franchise of movies. No progress on them there, but with the original Black Cauldron animation still out there, still ahead of its time, but still very much overlooked, it might be really quite fitting that this this dark chapter in Disney's history comes a bit full circle and gets really the appreciation it deserves. Just do not show it to your kids unattended. And that brings me to the end of this latest episode of Film Stories. As always, thank you so much for listening and thank you for your time. If I've not bored you completely, you can find more from me on Twitter at Simon Brew. You can find more from the entire Film Stories project at Film Stories. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash Film Stories Online. You can find us on YouTube where we're putting some of these podcasts and some of our reviews as well at youtube.com slash Film Stories. Our website is filmstories.co.uk where you can find news, reviews, features across film tv and gaming and if you go to store.filmstories.co.uk that's where you'll find all of our print magazines for sale that i told you about in the middle of this episode but i think i've waffled on long enough i've got a whole host of specials i'm putting together for you which you'll find out about soon main thing as always you all take care you all look after yourselves i will be back soon with another bunch of film stories thank you so much for listening bye bye